She tried to wake her husband up at 5 a.m., only to discover that he had been severely beaten to death as they slept. Well, how on earth did this woman sleep through a bludgeoning murder? Or was there more to the story about the murder of John Stagner? Well, hey, everybody, welcome from Orlando, Florida. I'm out here on business. I've been meeting with law enforcement in the area. And if you're like me, this one's going to be a head scratcher for you from the get go. I mean, how does the wife of a murdered man sleep throughout the night while her husband is beaten to death in bed? He was beaten with an axe handle. Well, I'm going to explain this case to you in detail. But first, I hope you'll take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button so that you don't miss any of our content when we release it. It was August 10th, 1992. That's 30 years ago this month. And it was a sweltering hot Orlando, Florida night. John Stagner worked as an Orange County maintenance worker. And he got in late that night from uh, his call out that was kind of an emergency that he had to run out with. Now, I've already said that it was hot, but hot doesn't explain it. I mean, Florida has temperatures soaring into the 90s most days during August. Night isn't much better with temperatures ranging somewhere between 75 and 80 degrees. And the humidity, it's almost unbearable, folks. Now, I traveled to the Stagner neighborhood to vicariously roll in the dirt, so to speak. It's a technique I learned from my friend, Phil Carlo, who wrote the book, The Night Stalker. Phil told me that it was really important that you get out and walk around in the area that you're writing about so that you can share the feelings and emotions you had while you were doing it. I wanted to share with you my personal assessment as I got out and walked around. I mean, the air was just heavy with moisture. It was hot, sweltering hot. But as I walked around, I found that it was really easy to do so quietly. Now, I come from a desert state. You step on branches that break or you have things that make a lot of noise. But this grass was so lush, the brush was so lush, that you could walk around quietly. When I walked through backyards and gardens, I noticed that you didn't make a sound. Again, the air was really heavy. You could feel the moisture in your nostrils. And for a guy, again, who lives in the desert, it was amazing. I mean, my skin didn't itch, and my eyes, they weren't irritated. Well, today... Most of the homes in that area have central air conditioning, and I assume most of them did back then. One thing I do know for sure, though, is the Stagner home definitely had air conditioning. And this is really important to know and to talk about. So I want you to listen as I talk about some of the evidence as I stand in a wooded area just outside the Stagner home. Well, hey folks, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. And like I said in my little introductory portion of this video, we're talking about the case of John Stagner who was murdered on August 10th, 1992. This is exactly 30 years ago. I happened to be in Orlando, Florida, working with law enforcement on a couple of issues. And I thought I'd take a moment to share with you how one cold case amazingly was solved after so long. It's a case that really deals with a whole bunch of different things. So let's kind of package it all together quickly. He was called out late one night to work on a problem that was going on. Now he and his wife slept in diff different bedrooms. They weren't having troubles. They just liked things a little differently at night. He liked to sleep with the windows open. And I'll tell you what, it is, let's see here, 90 degrees. It's a cool day by Florida standards. The humidity is probably 100, and uh, it feels awfully hot and muggy for, for me, a guy from the mountains in dry, humid, or dry uh, arid areas like Utah. But here's the deal. This guy liked to sleep with his bedroom windows open at night. His wife wanted to use the air conditioner. You know, I drove out to North Forsyth Road where this murder happened 30 years ago and I started looking around. I stopped and looked at the house and looked around in the backyard. 
walked into the area where the suspect would have likely entered this residence. Now it's really interesting because again, everything is pretty low to the ground. The windows are easy to climb in and out and think about it. This guy was sleeping with his window open. We talk about risk and risk assessments. Here's a perfect example. If you're gonna sleep with your window open, only have it open a short distance and then have something in there, a wood dowel preferably, or a screw in the door to win, uh, window to prevent it from sliding too far open. Instead, this predator was able to sneak into the house. He was able to bludgeon Stagner to death with his wife sleeping in the room right next door. Can you imagine her horror when she woke the following morning, went in to wake her husband up and felt him cold and lifeless? In fact, he was stiff as a board, which is what happens when the body goes through that process of death. She called police. Like all spouses, probably was considered a suspect at first. But well, quickly, law enforcement focused on a family friend named Ronald Stephen Cates. As I dug further into this case, I learned that Cates had confessed to killing Stagner several times over the last 30 years. And if that was true, I wondered why on earth did it take investigators so long to finally charge the guy with murder? Cates was a suspect from the beginning, according to the Orange County Sheriff, John Minya, who said that they just couldn't put the case together back then. But now, with the advancements in forensics, and frankly, a whole lot of luck, Cates sits in an Orange County, Florida jail. They just extradited him from North Carolina. On August 10th in 1992, our deputies responded to North Forsyth Road, uh, where they found 53-year-old John Stagner deceased. He had head and facial trauma. So at the time, our detectives uh, did suspect a friend of his named Ronald Cates. He would um, you know, frequently borrow money and tools from Mr. Stagner, um, but we didn't have enough probable cause at that time to make an arrest. So, And today, um, actually, 30 years to the day, uh, Ronald Cates is in jail in North Carolina, and we have charged him with this homicide. He's being charged with first-degree homicide. So let's explore the facts as we know them. Early that morning, Mrs. Stagner tried to wake up her husband at around 5 a.m., shaking him. It was then that she discovered that he was unresponsive and cold. And when she turned on the lights, she discovered his badly beaten body. She called 911 for help. This guy was beaten severely. Let's listen as Orange County Sheriff's Detective Kevin Wilson tells us a little bit more about who Stagner is and what happened on that fateful morning. John Stagner was a, a very hardworking man that worked for Orange County. He was a maintenance worker that actually lived on the Orange County maintenance property. Um, on the early, early morning of August 10th of 1992, about five in the morning, uh, his wife uh, went in to wake him up and he was cold to the touch and deceased with head trauma. Um, detectives responded out, spoke to the wife, spoke to her mother um, and processed the crime scene. Uh, at the time, they knew based off interviews with family members that there was a good friend, Ronald Cates, of the family that uh, borrowed several power tools, uh, other items from Mr. Stagner because he was a very giving man. Stagner would allow Cates to borrow his tools. Sadly, this usually ended up being a time when Cates would go off and pawn this, these prop pieces of property to get money to support his drug habit. Something that happens a lot in these kinds of cultures and situations. And it really teaches us a lot. Again, when, when we talk about risk in uh, profiling evil, I'm always talking about, I'm not victim blaming, but I'm always talking about what could we do to minimize the amount of risk that we take in our lives when we're dealing with cases like this. Here's a perfect example that Stagner could have reduced his own level of risk by doing a couple of simple things. One, he could have been really careful about what he's lo loaning to somebody who has a narcotic habit. And if he is gonna do it, 
not have an expectation that he's gonna get his property back. It sounds like the night before the murder, he put pressure on Cates to return the property or to pay for it. Instead, Cates simply killed him, according to all the media reports and according to a confession that we're gonna talk about a little later. But here's the deal. He could have avoided loaning those things to him, try to help in other ways. What else could he do to reduce his risk? Well, if he's gonna sleep in a room with his window open, he could have put in a, a, a wooden dowel. Don't put a metal one in because a metal one can, can have a magnet on the other side of the glass to lift the metal rod out of the glass window uh, and, and make it easy to slide that window open. A wood dowel makes it much more difficult. Or preferably, if you're gonna sleep with a window open, uh, make sure that you put a screw into the window from the inside of the room so the window can't slide any further out. And you gotta have to protect it so that the window can't be lifted and pulled out as well. A couple of simple tips that would have probably saved John Stagner's life. But you know what? It didn't. And this guy died as a result of his goodness. Now we're gonna look a little deeper into the case when I go back into the office here, but I wanted you to kind of get out of the area. I'm here at the local park here on North Forsyth Road, just a short distance from where John Stagner was brutally beaten to death. Well, why on earth would Cates kill Stagner? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, and frankly, it may have been as simple as it was his answer to avoid paying a debt. Now, public sources suggest that Cates probably had a really bad drug habit, and it wasn't unlike him at all to take things that he had gotten and pawn them in order to get money to pay for more narcotics. But again, why? Why would he then be pushed to commit murder? unless he was afraid Stagner was going to have him arrested or in that fear of going to jail and not having drugs just kind of overpowered his senses. I also wondered if it could have been that he was just so psychologically damaged from drug abuse that he wasn't in his right mind. I mean, who would be in their right mind to commit murder? But regardless, he's allegedly responsible for the brutal beating of Stagner killed the guy. Now again, think about how loud it would be to beat someone to death with a big wood handle. Stagner's wife, Dottie, told investigators that she heard a noise that night, but she didn't investigate it. Now most of Stagner's family have already died, but there are a few of them left that continued to talk with law enforcement throughout the years. They, they told some really important things that I want to share. First, that on the day following the homicide, that next morning, sheriff's deputies attempted to interview Ronald Cates at his home. Now, they reported that Cates wasn't at the residence, but they indicated that they were really troubled by his 12-year-old daughter, who, who seemed terrified, even though she was telling investigators that he wasn't around. They finally found Cates later that day at home, and they had a short interview with him. Now, this is important. Remember that. He, he again was interviewed seven days later. And police reports suggest that there were inconsistent versions of his alibi that really started to trouble them. And frankly, put him more and more in the spotlight of suspicion. In reality, Cates was at home during the time the investigators made their first attempt at finding him. You know, it would take that little 12-year-old girl decades to build up the courage to finally tell investigators that her father was hiding beneath their house and that she had been told to tell him that he wasn't home. She also shared that he made her help him burn his clothing after police left the area. Well, three years later, in 1995, Ronald Cates had some kind of a psychological and suicidal event. And during a moment of crisis, he admitted to family and friends on multiple levels that he killed John Stagner, yelling, I killed Johnny. Well, the witness to that event told investigators about it, but Cates, when questioned, discounted it, saying he had nothing to do with Stagner's death. 
So we see something really interesting here. Emotionally, he gets to the point he can't stand it anymore, relieves himself of this burden, but then he thinks, I got a lot to lose. And he makes up the case that, no, I didn't have anything to do with it. Keep this in mind, folks, because there's a dialogue out there that Cates is now repentant and confessing to the murder. Now, there's more to come on this, but keep it in mind. I want to recap it. Three years earlier, just hours after John Stagner was beaten to death, police responded to Ronald Cates' home, and, and there they found that he was not at home. Well, he was hiding underneath the house, avoiding police detection. They found him later that day, and he had, on that particular day, two chances to come clean with law enforcement and confess to the murder. Instead, he said he wasn't there. He didn't know anything about it. I mean, this guy could have said that it was an accident after a heated exchange over the tools. He, he could have even blamed his drug dependency on this and that he wasn't thinking clearly, but he didn't. He denied any knowledge on that day and following the murder uh, two times on that day. Then this guy denied any knowledge of the crime a week later when law enforcement again questioned him about his involvement in the thing. And now move three years further down the road again after saying, I killed Johnny uh, when police went to interview him, he said he had nothing to do with it and didn't know what they were talking about. Now, to me, this is a pretty clear picture of a man who's trying to hide what's now being alleged as his participation in John Stagner's murder. Where he claimed and made admissions that he, uh, he did kill Johnny Stagner. He said it several times in front of his family members. Uh, but at the time, with uh, evidence and technology the way it was uh, back then, there was not enough to charge the case and arrest Mr. Cates at that time. Then, 28 years later, the suspect's family members reached out again to Orange County investigators, hoping that the investigation was still underway. It seems that enough time had passed that they had built up the courage to talk a little more. Cates' children were now adults. That 12-year-old terrified little girl, she wasn't afraid any longer. Kate's wife also wasn't afraid, and she felt like she was safe enough that she could talk to police and share her opinions about the guy, and especially about two peculiar times of year, the month of April and the month of August. Uh, so in 2020, actually, um, a family member of the Kate's family contacted the sheriff's office and got this ball rolling again, and several detectives... Um, started looking more into the John Stagner case, uh, spoke to family members, <clears throat> daughters, um, the wife of Mr. Cates as well, and um, kept, kept, kept it going more or less because the family really uh, cared about this case, even if they were the suspect's family, because Mr. Stagner was very, very good to the Cates family. He uh, would give them money at the time when they needed it, the family members felt like they could come out and tell a little bit more of their story because they were in fear of Mr. Cates their whole lives because he was very abusive to them and uh, they were in fear for him. Yeah, during that time, Kate's wife told investigators that Kate's would often become temperamental during April and August, moody, emotional, depressed. Now, August made sense to her because that's when Stagner was murdered. Remember, August 10th, 1992. But April, finally, it struck her. She theorized April was important because that's when Stagner would have celebrated his birthday. In fact, family members continued to reach out to Orange County Sheriff's deputies to talk about this case because they were convinced, they were convinced that their father had committed this homicide. Their goal, help law enforcement solve this murder to a family the Stagners, a family that they really liked. Well, there you go. And if we look into Kate's life, we're gonna see that there are a couple of things that happened throughout his life. So let's take a moment and go back and retrace what I've been able to under, uncover on Kate's. Now I'm using information I got through a, a partner that I use called Truthfinder. 
True Finder is incredibly powerful and it gives you a way to look for publicly available information on people and use that information to gather more uh, insight into them. It might be for you to go out and look for your next date, to find your missing loved one, or to look into criminal cases like this one. You can get more information about Truthfinder in the links below. And I want you to know that they're an affiliate, which means we get a small commission if in fact you do purchase their services from time to time. It's about enough to buy a Diet Dr. Pepper. But now let's get back to this case. And then nearly two years later, the biggest break in the case came when Detective Wilson re-interviewed Kate's family members. It was then, early in the year, that he learned more about Kate's. And he learned that Kate's used to walk around with a large axe handle. It was partially wrapped in electrical tape. Now, it always bothered the family that after the murder of John Stagner, Kate's walking stick was no longer around. He didn't have it. You know, they kind of thought about it and then let it go. But they wondered knowing that Stagner had been bludgeoned to death about that axe handle. But nobody ever thought to ask the question. So my question was, did police find the... So my question was, did police find the axe handle? Finally, one of them did ask police about the axe handle. And Detective Wilson went back and scoured through all of the crime scene photos. He looked through every piece of evidence. You know, they still house the evidence from that murder 30 years ago in the sheriff's office evidence lockers. And to Wilson's surprise, he found the axe handle among evidence that had been collected. He had the murder weapon. Now, in April of 2022, the second big break happened when Cates went to a mental hospital and told a nurse that he had murdered a man in Orange County back in 1992. Think about this. Rather than assuming that these were the ramblings of a mentally ill man, the nurse did some digging on the internet. This is the value of socialized intelligence, the sharing information to the true crime community. She discovered that John Stagner's unsolved murder case was on the Orange County Sheriff's website in the year 1992. She dialed her local police department and they sent two patrol officers over to talk with Cates. Cates quickly confessed. In fact, this guy told them to turn on their body cameras and they recorded a 10-minute long confession to the murders. <laughs> Thrilled, Orange County investigators jumped on a plane and flew to North Carolina to talk to Cates. But once again, the guy denied having anything to do with the murder. Now, keep in mind my previous comments about confessing. I mean, think about this. Four times this guy had the opportunity to set the record straight, and he didn't. Remember, he was questioned on the day of the murder. He, number one, he hid, and when he was questioned on the day after the murder, he said, I don't know anything about it. Seven days later, he was questioned again. His response, don't know anything about it. And then, three years after that, uh, in a critical mental health moment, he yells out, I killed Johnny. He later retracted that when police questioned him, saying, I don't know anything about the murder. And then he confesses in April of 2022 to once again murdering John Stagner. When police questioned him, he didn't respond, said he had nothing to do with it. So what are your thoughts about this, folks? I mean, do you believe him when he says, I killed Johnny? I'm going to be reading your answers down below. But take a moment and let's listen to Detective Wilson one more time. Okay. And in April 2022, he, uh, he actually confessed to um, Salisbury Police Department in the hospital up there. He was in there for basically a Baker Act, but in North Carolina. And he uh, asked to speak to someone, speak to a nurse. And a nurse heard him say that he killed someone in, in Florida. In 1992, 
So she summoned the help of a security guard at that hospital, actually. And the security guard listened to what Mr. Cates had to say, and they did some research on our Orange County Sheriff's Office webpage, uh, website, and realized that it was actually a John Stagner 1992 cold case. And they summoned Salisbury PD to come in in North Carolina and two um, patrol officers uh, on body cam obtained probably about a 10 or 12 minute um, confession about this uh, murder. Um, and then from then on that point, um, there was enough evidence at that point to be able to uh, go up and interview Mr. Uh, Cates again, charge him with our homicide here in Florida. Well, I love the way Sheriff Minya wrapped up his comments about the need to continue investigating cold cases. This sheriff knows something about cold cases. He's got more than 500 unsolved cases that are waiting for answers. He's created a cold case unit to go back and look at them. That's 500 families that wake up every single day wondering if today is going to be the day that their case is solved. So these cases are extremely important to us. We want our community to know that uh, just because the case is a year old or five years old or 30 years old uh, doesn't mean we stop investigating the case. And so we know that um, and we remember that every homicide victim leaves behind family and loved ones and friends and that has an absence in their life because of these tragic crimes. So if crimes. you know anything about these cases, please pick up the phone and call law enforcement and say something. Again, 500 cases in Orange County, Florida alone. We've looked into Kate's background. Now this guy has confessed in jail to committing a murder. Orange County Sheriff's deputies packed him up and brought him back to Florida where he now faces criminal charges. This is gonna be an interesting one and I hope you'll take time to watch this case unfold. I think it's gonna have some interesting twists and turns, but it's a great example of a couple of things that I wanna close with. First, risk assessment. There are things that we can do to minimize the amount of risk that we're willing to take in our lives. We all need to still be good people. We need to try to help out. We need to try to bless the lives of other people, but we can't do it at the risk of our own safety or the safety of our family and loved ones. So think about how you can minimize your risk. You can go back and watch my earlier videos on victim risk assessments and the victim risk continuum to see how you can do more. I hope you'll share that with all your friends and loved ones. Now, the next thing we're gonna learn from this case is that time is not necessarily the enemy to these cold cases. This is proof that this case continued to haunt Cates throughout his life. May have led to a whole bunch of additional kinds of mental health issues that this guy faced. And we're gonna learn more about that as the case evolves and unfolds. Think about this for a moment. This has haunted him his entire life for the last 30 years. In 2015, when Cates was in a real a mental health crisis, he shouted out, I killed Johnny Stagner. Nobody could do anything with it, but it inched law enforcement a little bit closer to resolution. Then recently, uh, just in April, this guy again lets the cat out of the bag that he murdered John Stagner. Law enforcement was able to go back in and record statements, and I think we're gonna see a good confession come out in the court proceedings in this. So to all of you in the true crime community from Florida, just miles from where the next rocket's gonna launch at NASA, I wanna say thanks for supporting Profiling Evil, and thanks for supporting me personally. I hope that you're subscribing to Profiling Evil. Make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button and ringing the bell so you get all of our notifications. Please share our channel with others. Make sure that you're looking at the uh, Profiling Evil Academy and all the stuff we're releasing on different pieces of criminal behavior. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. And by all means, make sure you're going to our website at profilingevil.com. There you can sign up for the BOLO and get up-to-date information. Every once in a while, we even send you an offer or two that you might be interested in. I'm grateful for our sponsors who make it possible for us to do so many things. But most importantly, I'm grateful for each of you for taking time to listen, to weigh in, 
to listen to each other's comments and, and focus in on each other's comments. We are really lucky folks because we have a community that seems to care. Hey, thanks a lot and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.